News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech and it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, fine high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left arm. Spent a little more in the store for a tag in the back. Welcome to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Well, no, 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 no. You're not going to believe it. This week, all the talk in Iowa and now nationally is, should Mitt Romney become the Republican nominee? A recent poll shows that in Iowa, he blows the field among Republicans. He has double-digit support, 35%, whereas every other Republican is polling way, way, way beneath him. And suddenly, on everybody's lips, Mitt Romney. And the question is, now that the Obama presidency has failed, and so many of Romney's projections have proved to be accurate and, in fact, prophetic, perhaps voters are going to turn to him in 2016. And maybe he's the man that will save the day. Up till now, he has said steadfastly that he will not run again. He had his crack at bat and he blew it, as he has said. And he has no intention of taking the Republican Party down that road one more time. But recently, he is starting to sing a different tune, possibly in reaction to so many people asking him to run, and also in reaction to this surge in voter support. Listen to his latest statements. We said, look, I I have had the chance of running. I didn't win. Someone else has a better chance than I do. And, and that's what we believe, and that's why I'm not running. And, you know, circumstances can change, but, but I'm just not going to let my head go there. I remember that great line from Dumb and Dumber uh, where, uh, where the— uh, So you're uh, telling me I have a chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. There you go. You remember. You're telling me I have a chance. That's one out of, one out of a million. <laughs> You know, he is sort of giving a wink and a nod that with enough pressure, he might jump back in. And I think that we, the conservatives and Republicans and Tea Party folks and anybody who loves this nation, we should just nip this in the bud as soon as possible. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't matter that he was right on so many issues. The fundamental problem is he cannot win in the general election. He simply is a loser. And we have to look reality in the face. There's no point in going through this whole circus one more time just to lose again. And why do I say so with utter conviction that he is a loser? It is very simple. And it's a story that I don't think the media covered enough. There is profound distrust among evangelical Christians regarding Mitt Romney. So this is the core of the Republican base. This is the core group that you need to get to the polls in order to win. It doesn't matter what people say about Romney might be able to attract moderates and independents. The key is, as happened in 2012, when there was every reason for evangelical Christians to go out and vote against Obama. They had hundreds of reasons to go out to the polls, and yet not enough of them did. In fact, more Christians voted for John McCain than did they did for Mitt Romney. So this is the big elephant in the room when we talk about Mitt Romney. Why do evangelical Christians refuse to back him? And the answer is not at all that he flip-flopped 
on something like uh, the pro-life question, once being pro-choice and now saying that he's pro-life. It's not that he appears to be a pragmatist on social issues. It's not that he appears to be more part of the establishment than part of the Tea Party movement. The problem that Christian evangelicals have is they are uncomfortable with a leader of this country who is a Mormon. Now, I'm not saying that I think that that's right. I, for example, applauded Mitt Romney. I I rooted for him during the 2012 campaign. But I learned the hard way, a lesson that my editor was trying to teach me when I was writing as an editorial writer at the Washington Times. I began to cover elections uh, in in the 2008 cycle. And one day she approached me and she said, you know, you got to take a look at this evangelical resistance to the Mormon faith and to a leader of the Mormon faith. And I was really flabbergasted by that. I had never really come across that issue. I thought, well, look, in our day and age, we're well beyond it. And lo and behold, the more research I did, the more I became convinced evangelical Christians view the Mormon faith with profound mistrust. And because their faith is such a central part of their calculations when they cast a ballot, they cannot bring themselves to go to the polls to endorse a Mormon. And I had this experience many times and throughout the 2012 campaign talking to evangelical Christians who are uncomfortable saying it because they fear they're going to be tagged as bigots of some kind. It doesn't matter what the reason is or isn't. I'm just saying right now that we are going down another dead end because many evangelical Christians based on the fact that they do not like a Mormon, are not going to go to the polls for Mitt Romney, period. I wish it weren't so, but it's so. And we're not going to change it. We're not going to change that dynamic between now and 2016. And another reason, too, I think, that many evangelical Christians are so reluctant to endorse anybody outside of their faith is precisely because... There were so many questions raised about Obama's faith. He is a Christian, he says, but there are so many who doubt the sincerity and depth of his Christian faith. And that, that, those doubts circulated in 2008. So now, after all of these years of having had the country led by somebody who truly doesn't represent Christian values, evangelical Christians are going to be even more reluctant as a matter of principle, to endorse anybody that is not a, an evangelical Christian. I think that unless we accept this reality, like I said, we're going right down a dead end. Now, Mormons are going to say, look, we are Christians. It doesn't matter. This barrier is so huge among evangelical Christians, it's going to take, I believe, several decades to try to alter this dynamic. So since it's not going to happen between now and 2016, Mitt Romney cannot win. And that's an issue that I don't think enough people are talking about, let alone all the other reasons that people are talking about, which means that he's going to end up being a very weak candidate. Don't forget, his performance among Hispanics, too, was dismal far worse than George W. Bush. And if you add on top of that, the way that he was outmaneuvered during the campaign, the way that he was presented as an out-of-touch patriarch, his statements, um, which were rather foolish, even though they were filmed at a private fundraiser, they were recorded at a private fundraiser, in which it appeared that he is the champion of only one class, one economic class, rather than all of the American people. If you add All of the negatives against Romney, including also that he did champion Romney care, which was the progenitor of Obamacare, and so on and so forth. There are so many negatives. We do not need to repeat this broken record. Are we that desperate as a party, as a movement, that we've got to endorse basically somebody that turned out to be a loser? And the way I look at it is this. If you can't beat Barack Obama... 
in 2012 when he had no record to run on and when all he had were smears, then you can't ever win. And I think that Republicans might be tricked by the mainstream media, again, to go down a disastrous, catastrophic, losing path. It's time to say we need fresh blood, a fresh face, somebody with a great record, somebody with a consistent record, somebody that connects with the common people, somebody that is going to put fire in the belly of evangelical Christians who are the base of the Republican Party to go out and vote and achieve a victory. So I want to say categorically, let us squash this Romney movement before it even takes flight because we're just going to waste a whole bunch of time. What we should be doing is nurturing a candidate that can win instead of talking about a loser who's going to lose again. Now, there's someone else I want to talk about. There's somebody else trying to rehabilitate himself in the media, and that's Marco Rubio. And this is a guy that I have come to thoroughly detest. This is another individual, a a, a senator who was a Tea Party darling, who the minute that his star was rising, he began to abandon the principles that got him to the dance. People voted on him, voted, voted for him because they believed in him. And the moment the national media was talking about this really talented senator who was articulate and capable and had tapped into the Tea Party movement but, but could also talk to the national media, his head inflated like a balloon. And you know what happened? He began to court principles that betray the very ones he had run on. He participated with the Gang of Eight to champion the total overhaul of the immigration system. In other words, he was for granting amnesty. I don't care how he tries to sugarcoat it now. Now he's coming out and he is saying that, no, 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 we all got it wrong. We all got it wrong. He had been saying early on, that the president couldn't be trusted to enforce immigration laws. And one of the reasons that he wanted comprehensive immigration reform was precisely because he wanted to ensure that uh, a mechanism would be in place that no Democrat, no leader could possibly tamper with the laws of the land. I don't care how he tries to spin it. He's clearly lying right now because his support for immigration reform was extremely damaging to him. It basically took him out of contention. At some point he was going on to the national media. He was saying that if we do nothing, it's tantamount to amnesty. He was for a couple of months, one of the biggest champions of amnesty. It ruined him in the party, and now he's trying to rehabilitate himself. And I'm here today to tell you, let us not have such short memories. This guy cannot be trusted. And I want to take you back to last year in a debate he had with Laura Ingram, just to remind everybody about how gung-ho he was for immigration reform. Roll it, Brittany. Immigration system. But there are parts we, of it that still need to be improved. That's the way the legislative here? process should work. Well, the, I think the great, this, the, this the, look, I, I, I think Marco Rubio, if he were in charge, Marco, if you were in charge of enforcing the border, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Okay. If, you, if that was you doing it down there, and if you were absolutely doing it, but people, you're right, have no faith in, in this border actually being enforced. They know that when Chuck Schumer, Dick Durbin, and Bob Menendez are giddy over the passage of a bill, Republicans, conservatives, uh, most people in the middle class who are seeing their wages stagnate or go down have something to worry about. So they're looking to you for leadership, uh, Senator Rubio. And I can tell you from my radio listeners, they think it's time to stop dividing the Republican Party on this issue with all your good intentions, and I know you have them. You're a terrific person. Uh, but people want us to focus on jobs, the economy, and raising the middle class uh, lifestyle and the wages here in this country before we start tackling an issue with this comprehensive approach, which I think we've seen uh, from Janet Napolitano getting all this discretion, is a very, very tricky business. Well, I think there's agreement about the discretion part, and that's what we're working on addressing. As far as immigration and the economy is concerned, it actually is linked to the economy. When, if you look at our legal immigration system, if we didn't have a single illegal immigrant, 
we'd still have to l reform our legal immigration system because it is related to our business and our and ability to do that separately. To all right, well, the separately. problem is that they're all interrelated. If but, you look at one of the drivers of illegal immigration is that we don't have a legal immigration system that works, for example, for temporary or guest workers in the agricultural sector, as an example. It's not a top priority if, for this if, country. If Chad Napolitano is in charge of it, I don't think you could possibly get it past the, the yeah. House. All objective right. metrics. We need objective well, metrics. No wiggle room. I would just remind everybody that uh, the president, uh, the good news is he'll only be president for the for next three and a half years, and, and that the longest she'll be around is that long. I hope they'll be replaced by people that are more serious about applying our laws and enforcing them and that's what we intend to do in this bill this bill is not a one-year deal or a three-year thing it is a 10-year process there'll be another administration in charge right. of implementing this stuff and our job is not just to leave it up to them but to actually come up with specifics right. in that bill you see he was so headlong into this he had jumped headlong into this immigration reform he thought it was going to catapult him to an even higher level of national stardom instead it backfired and i'm here to remind everybody don't be fooled by this guy he's a slippery fox who cannot be trusted and so let us say very clearly no to mitt romney you are not going to take over the Republican Party lead us to another disastrous defeat. And no to rehabilitating Marco Rubio. You're listening to Dr. Grace, who has a long memory and upholds values that are never going to die. Sometimes I feel I've got to Run away, I've got to get away. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Got a real good feeling, something bad about to happen. This is Dr. Grace, and bad things are happening all around the world, and we told you so. Latest reports are that Russian troops have now crossed right into Ukraine, and the battle there is on. We told you so. When you let one tyrant get away with gobbling up a big piece of territory like Crimea, more bad things are going to happen. Evil begets more evil. Evil unchecked begets more evil. And that cycle grows at an astronomical rate because what happens is American forces then are stretched thin. Right now, we can't even deal with what's going on in Ukraine because we have an even bigger crisis in Iraq as ISIS has run amok taking over large territory in Syria and Iraq. And recently, they beheaded a journalist, Mr. Foley, in full public view, a heinous, barbaric, disgusting act, which even the administration has had to define as an act of terrorism against the American people. Well, the nincompoop in chief has tried to say for years that he was really there elected to, quote unquote, clean up the mess that George Bush had made. But in reality, George Bush was cleaning up the mess that Bill Clinton had made because it was under Clinton's watch that Al Qaeda grew and grew. And George Bush cleaned it up. He launched two wars. He knew how to conduct war. By 2011, we had Iraq stabilized. And guess what? The nincompoop in chief, another Democrat, made another mess. And that is, he did not keep his eye on the ball. And as a result, another organization, even more barbaric, even more heinous than Al-Qaeda has emerged. And it is wrecking havoc in that part of the world. And it is threatening us here in the homeland. So, what do we know now? A new report has come out. 
And this report tells us, it's a report uh, by West Point, it's a, a, a counterterrorism center, and it, ha- it, it details the rise of ISIS. How is it that they became so powerful so quickly? Did it really happen in a matter of months, as the president has led us to believe? No! The growth of ISIS was four years in the making. The report details how Since 2010, they were amassing weapons. They were planning how to defeat Americans in Iraq. They were doing it methodically, skillfully, carefully, patiently. And they were doing it in plain public view. So this is clearly a mess a cancer, to use the words that Barack Obama has used recently, that has emerged during the Obama presidency. It is his mistake. Now, following the beheading, he's trying to talk tough, and he's trying to tell the American people that we're not going to rest until we handle this. I didn't hear him take responsibility for his mess, not even once. Listen to this. But our message to anyone who harms our people is simple. America does not forget. Our reach is long. We are patient. Justice will be done. We have proved time and time again we will do what's necessary to capture those who harm Americans, to go after those who harm Americans. And we'll continue to take direct action where needed to protect our people and to defend our homeland. And rooting out a cancer like ISIL won't be easy and it won't be quick. But tyrants and murderers before them should recognize that kind of hateful vision ultimately is no match for the strength and hopes of people who stand together for the security and dignity and freedom that is the birthright of every human being. Oh, shut up. Oh, just shut up. You are an adolescent you owe George Bush a huge apology. In fact, right now, you sound like George Bush. You sound like George Bush when Bush was talking about Al-Qaeda. And had you just done your homework, and had you just done what Daddy Bush had laid out for you to just complete, we wouldn't have this problem right now. This is such a colossal mistake that was so easily preventable That right now, this president should be on his hands and knees begging for forgiveness of the parents of Mr. Foley and begging for forgiveness to the American people and to all the Iraqis who are now being slain at the hands of this barbaric horde. Well, there is such outrage all across this country, and I think one of the best commentators on this topic has been Mark Levine, who has contextualized what a colossal screw-up this is. Roll it, Brittany. You know, I want the American people to understand something, Sean. The commander-in-chief, and we only have one, is the President of the United States, and his name is Barack Obama. And these cockroaches organized, themselves, built a forceful military, started conquering uh, geographic areas all around the world under his nose. He ignored it. He did nothing about it. He didn't talk to the American people about it. As a matter of fact, he downplayed it. This is one of the worst military national security screw-ups in modern American history, and he's still screwing up. Has he rallied the American people? Has he spoken to Congress? Has he asked for a declaration of war or at least a joint resolution to fund an aggressive, offensive attack against these cockroaches? No, he hasn't. We're dealing with a very peculiar, petulant man who operates with a few advisors around him, a man who really needs as much counseling and expertise as he can get, given his very thin resume and experience record. And this is what's going on. You know, he presented it, the president did, he presented the defeat of the Iraqi forces as something that just happened, wow, right out of the blue. Instead, this report that comes out of West Point says very clearly that the shattering of Iraq's security forces in June is a case in point, pointing to the fact that ISIS 
presented their operation or prepared their operation with years of patience. They were preparing to shatter Iraqis' forces for years, and they were doing it methodically, patiently, waiting for the right time. And of course, the right time came when it was announced way ahead of time how quickly the Americans were going to cut and run. This president allowed for the growth of ISIS to occur right under his nose. And now what? Now what do we face? Do we face just leaving the region? No, we can't leave the region. Because he and his entire national security team has realized, oh, Shazam, more liberals mugged by reality, that if we don't fight them there, we have to fight them here. Suddenly you have Chuck Hagel saying things like, oh, my goodness, this is an imminent threat. We've been saying it's an imminent threat for over a decade. These radical Islamists are an imminent threat. That's why we've launched two wars. Suddenly these liberals who are going to bring peace on earth have woken up to what we've been ringing the alarm bells over for over a decade. And now what? More bombing. More killing. We've got to bomb ISIS in Iraq. The president is looking at launching airstrikes in Syria. And instead of the war getting smaller, the war gets bigger. Instead of less Americans dying, ultimately more will die because you've got to expand the years of combat. And that is the key point that I have been making. If you don't strike fast and hard and quick and with everything you've got, you end up having to sacrifice more lives. More people die. Essentially, if you don't fire your gun quickly at those who do evil, you end up having to kill more and more people. It is the cardinal rule of hawkish diplomacy. It is the only way to deal with barbarians. Because when a barbarian is coming after you. Your choice is not peace or war. Your choice is a little war or a big war. Those are the only two choices. And if you're going to fight a little war, it's got to be quick, decisive, and with the full might of your arms in play. Not these little wimpy wars that American is America is fighting. So now we have... Trouble, turmoil all around the world, possible airstrikes in Syria, Putin being emboldened. And we also have to ask ourselves this question. What about those young boys that already died in Iraq and Afghanistan? This week, I want you all to turn to World Tribune. There is a really compelling letter written by Billy and Karen Vaughn. They lost their boy, Aaron Vaughn in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan in 2011, they have written an open letter to the president telling him simply to resign. And they are asking him to resign because they say, you are not up for the job. You know it and we know it. That letter has the emotional power of parents who have given their all for this country and who see clearly that more parents are going to have to grieve more boys because we have a commander-in-chief that cannot win wars. He cannot finish wars. He cannot conduct wars. He cannot win wars. And instead of telling us that we need to be fighting ISIS for years more to come, he should be handing over his resignation letter so somebody who is up for the job can, can, can take over and can defeat these barbaric forces in the way that they should be defeated with quick, quick swift, decisive, forceful, and uncompromising action. You're listening to Dr. Grace upholding values that are never going to die. Down and the flames went higher and it burns, burns, burns. The ring of fire, the ring of fire. 
This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I'm too sexy for my shirt. Too sexy for my shirt. So sexy it hurts. And I'm too sexy. Welcome to American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at World Tribune. Everybody is obsessed with being sexy. It is the plague, the curse of our time. We have become a very vain group of people here in America, and I would say even around the world. You know, vanity used to be considered one of the seven deadly sins. Such a focus on oneself, and also such a focus on what is clearly a very superficial part of the self. Well, instead of this being obeyed in any way, instead of this diminishing with the rise of talented women in this country and around the world, with the rise of feminism, which emphasizes female ability, instead of the focus on looks diminishing, it seems that we're going in the opposite direction. And the direction is growing more and more extreme. Here to talk about an extreme case of vanity, obsession with one's looks, is a brilliant person. She is the senior news writer and editor at Alliance Defending Freedom. And if you don't know that organization, it is a nonprofit which defends Christians who are being persecuted both at home and around the world. She is also a former speechwriter for Senator Rick Santorum. She has a really, really long resume. She's a brilliant person. She has an upcoming piece in World Tribune where she discusses body dysmorphia, which is today's topic. And in full disclosure, she is my little sister, but not so little anymore. Her name is Lori Danovoro. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, I was blown away by the piece that you wrote, which is going to be out this week. Can you tell us to what extremes this, uh, the vanity that is in America is going to nowadays? Well, it's really quite scary and shocking, but uh, just last week, um, a 16-year-old girl named Lolita Ritchie, she's actually a Ukrainian native, she did an interview with the Daily Mirror, and she was bragging about how she looks exactly like Barbie. She has Barbie's exact proportions. She has a 20-inch waist, a 32F bra size, and uh, she claims that this is not um, due to plastic surgery or dieting uh, or not even Photoshop, but that it's all natural. And, um, but if you look at pictures of her just two years ago, she looks very normal. She doesn't look this plastic and contrived. Uh, and she follows uh, other women who have also tried to look like Barbie. In April, um, there were several other women. Uh, there's one in particular named Valeria Lukianova. They actually called her the human Barbie, and she did an interview with GQ talking about her transformation into Barbie. And uh, these women are very proud to look like the doll, and they're focusing solely on their external looks and doing crazy things to their bodies to look that way. And it's just not natural, and it's, it's a real detriment to the human spirit, and, and it, it's diminishing their human dignity. You know, I wonder, though, where this is coming from. Like, I played with Barbie. You played with Barbie. When we were playing with Barbie in our youth, it never once occurred to me that I should go see a plastic surgeon at some point in my life to try to replicate this thing in my hands, which I clearly knew was an element of fantasy. Uh, what do you think is driving this, uh, obviously, an extreme uh, quest for some kind of ideal of physical perfection? Well, it's definitely the media in Hollywood. They are definitely perpetrating this idea that to be beautiful, you have to look a certain way. You have to be excessively thin. You have to have a big breast. Uh, you have to have certain, you know, you've got to be a blonde or uh, look a certain way. And I think the more that the media in Hollywood are portraying this ideal of beauty that doesn't exist and is not even natural, many Hollywood celebrities uh, I even admit to having had plastic surgery. Uh, Hollywood no long, uh, Hollywood is emphasizing the external looks of a woman as opposed to emphasizing the true beauty of a woman that it lies within. 
they should be focusing on to help encouraging women to affirm their character, their virtue, discipline, courage, all these wonderful ideals instead of just emphasizing the external. Yes, it's unfortunate because in Hollywood's golden age, we once valued uh, inner beauty. When you look at Katherine Hepburn, Lauren Bacall, or Audrey Hepburn, I mean, they were considered um, beautiful, not just on the outside, but on the inside. And they displayed grace, poise, modesty, and there was just a, a beautiful code of beauty they embraced that transcended the external. Yeah, now you're raising a very interesting point because what we define as beauty beautiful has changed. It, it, the golden age of Hollywood, obviously you had lots of these women that were physically beautiful, but what they also embodied is, as you say, they embodied the virtues of feminine beauty, like gracefulness, like modesty, like humility. And some of these women say like Audrey Hepburn, I mean, she was celebrated for her humanitarian work. So it went just be, it went beyond what she was, what she looked like physically. Yes. She won the presidential medal of freedom in 1992 as a, for all her work with UNICEF as a goodwill ambassador. And she herself had said that the beauty of a woman is not in a facial mole, but is reflected in her soul. So she strongly was a strong advocate and understood that, as many did in the past. But it seems like we've gotten very far from that uh, notion nowadays. Well, we sure have. Uh, but you know what? There's a big pushback against this because so many women are suffering from their own body image. Can you tell us about the medical term that is now used and uh, Rumer Willis's own struggle with this? Uh, well, yes, there's now something called body dysmorphia, and it's actually a physical illness whereby um, it's a mental illness whereby a person believes their appearance is defective. And Tallulah Willis, actually, uh, oh, sorry the youngest, that. the 20-year-old youngest daughter of Bruce Willis and Demi Moore, she recently gave an interview for Style Like You, a style website, and they're doing a project called the What's Underneath Project. And the project is all about emphasizing that the self-worth of a woman lies not on her body size but, or her clothes, but on her um, inner, inner worth. And so uh, Tallulah Willis says that it was just by constantly seeing the tabloids as she was growing up and how they were mocking her body and face uh, that she began to have this, um, this defective idea of what she looked like and that she thought she wasn't attractive. So it really shapes the way you see your 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 physical uh, body, kind of like an anorexia. Right, right. So now we have a term for it, and I think that's going to be very helpful. That's very empowering, so that there's a sense that there is a reality, and somebody's perception of oneself when they when young women perceive themselves to be ugly, unattractive, that that's something that they can overcome. You know. Women are being told that their bodies don't quite fit the mold in one way, shape, or another. I think this is a form of abuse. This, to me, is a form of psychological abuse on women nowadays. Uh, there are some women that are fighting back beautifully. And I want to highlight Misty Copeland. She is a ballet dancer. She's a soloist for the American Ballet Theater. She has a brilliant ad out nowadays where she celebrates the fact that she was told that her body wasn't the right fit for ballet. And she persevered and she showed them all how wrong they were. Listen to this ad. Dear candidate, thank you for your application to our ballet academy. Unfortunately, you have not been accepted. You lack the right feet, Achilles tendons, turnout, torso length, and bust. You have the wrong body for ballet, and at 13, you are too old to be considered. Well, that is what Misty Copeland was told, and the rest of the ad shows her body, which is nothing short of magnificent, and it shows what her body can do, how what a gorgeous ballet dancer she is. So this is an example of a woman fighting back and saying, I'm not going to take this psychological abuse where you try to tell me that I am not beautiful or that my body is somehow not fit for the job. Uh, you have other examples in your piece of uh, movements, people fighting back. Yes, there's actually uh, an artist called Nikolai Lamb, and he's in the process of raising enough money to produce 
what he calls the Lamely doll. And this is a doll um, which uh, has the set measurements of an average uh, 19-year-old teenager, and the measurements are based on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for an average 19-year-old. And um, the, the doll wears makeup, but only mineral makeup, and promotes a healthy lifestyle and wears sneakers. So he wants to give women a realistic alter- alternative to this iconic doll and uh, because he believes that Barbie misrepresents the average female body size. Well, that's really interesting, and I'm glad there's some pushback. But at the same time, as we said before, it's not just the doll in isolation, right? Because Barbie, 20 years ago, many of us played with her, and we didn't somehow get this dysmorphia. We didn't get dysmorphia back then, and nowadays we do. So I think that this is a step in the right direction. But more than that, we have to launch a cultural awareness and a cultural crusade against this overemphasis on female looks. We've got to return our young girls to focusing on being kind and gentle and good, the virtues of their soul, rather than their external appearance. Well, Laura Dana, thank you so much for uh, raising awareness on this issue. Thank you for being on the show. You've been listening to Laura Dana Voto, the senior news writer and editor at Alliance Defending Freedom. Thank you, Laurie. Well, you know what? That is... Another uh, issue, and as we know, as, as, as Lori writes in her piece, it doesn't only affect women nowadays. Even men are becoming embroiled in this quest for physical perfection. There are even men who are having surgery to try to look like Ken, if you can believe it. So this whole question of being overly vain is spreading beyond affecting only women. It's starting to affect men. And we really should take a stand against it and affirm that the way God made us is absolutely perfect. You're listening to Dr. Grace, upholding values that never die. When you talk, when you talk about yourself, you were wrong. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Two bad feet on the dashboard. American Heartland. This is Dr. Grace, and I've had an incredible summer, the summer of 2014. I'm going to remember it very, very fondly. Beautiful time at the beach in Cape Cod with my little ones. Lots of good times in Canada with my family. Also had family coming he- coming to my home. So lots of good times, lots of highlights. And I want to take a moment here because I do follow the culture in America very closely. And I follow arts and fil- movies and films, movies, films and television very closely too as part of my role as the culture editor at World Tribune. I want to celebrate a series that is absolutely phenomenal. It is by far the best thing on television. It was the best thing on television in the summer of 2014. The final episode of season one aired on Tuesday, and I'm talking about Tyrant. It is a TV series that takes place in the Middle East, and it is a drama that crosses several worlds. You have a doctor from California who returns to his country of origin. And in that country, his father is a dictator. And his brother assumes the reins of power after the father dies. Now, this doctor from California, he has initially fled his past. He has fled his life. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the Middle East. And yet, when he returns... And he sees the chaos unfolding in his home country. He believes that he has to bring democracy there. Now, this is an absolutely brilliant story because in its larger sense, it's a metaphor for America. America intervening in the Middle East. 
And this entire series is written by somebody who understands both the Middle East really well and who understands America really well. So the dialogue is nothing short of brilliant. Now, apart from all the political themes that one can uncover in this drama, there's also a human drama. It's the story of a family, especially the story of two brothers, one who is an idealist and another brother who has had long experience next to the power that his father was wielding, and therefore he's much more pragmatic and even brutal. And the key question is this, whose vision of the Middle East is the right one? Is anybody's vision correct? I want you to listen to uh, a small um, promo piece of Tyrant, just so that you get a flavor for what I think is by far the best show on television. Roll it, Brittany. I'm not saying don't use violence because it's wrong. I'm saying don't use violence because it doesn't work. Tell me what will work, not what won't. The relationship between Jamal and Barry is really at the core of the show. There's political and family tensions there. And of course, it all relates back to when they were kids. Jamal is really a complicated character and uh, has bad sides and good sides. You're insane. Jamal, what is he talking about? Nothing that concerns you. Oh, really? Because I'd be interested to hear Layla's opinion on that. Why don't we ask her? Yes, please. I would love that. No, it's between you and me. You know, Jamal is someone who is so out of control at times that he needs to be protected from himself. The Psalm is definitely an incredible conflict constantly with his past. So I think now he's looking at himself in the mirror. It didn't feel like my place to get involved. Your father is dead. Your brother was nearly killed. Your nephew's wife is being held hostage. What more needs to happen before you feel compelled to get involved? He's facing the Bassam he left when he was a kid. It is a true love-hate relationship. They love each other, but they are also opposites in terms of what they think is best, uh, both for their families and for the country. Our people will thrill to their president's words. There's a lot of struggle. You know, there you can hear so much of what is brilliant about this. I think that the individual who totally steals the show is Ashram Barom. He's the actor who plays Jamal, the brother who takes over from his father. He is at once violent and volatile. And what he portrays so brilliantly is even if you want to bring democracy to the Middle East, can you do it? Or in reality... Are you just going to relinquish the reins so that some other faction is going to imp impose a dictatorship? And ultimately, is the real answer in which dictatorship is the more benevolent one? So you have the brother who represents this realistic assessment of the Middle East. On the other hand, you have the American doctor who is conflicted just like the American public is conflicted. Should I intervene? Should I not intervene? Is it my duty to intervene to help rescue those who may be butchered by the tyrants? But when he does try to intervene, what we also see is that there are so many unintended consequences. And that's what's utterly brilliant. Just like Americans have intervened in the Middle East, and it has been a learning process for all of us, as we have seen consequences unfold that hardly anybody could predict. You see this doctor now embroiled in a situation where events are moving fast and furious. And there's another really brilliant layer to the plot, and that is the State Department is involved. So the State Department at one point conspires with the American uh, doctor to overthrow the tyrannical brother. And then you see how the State Department, who is intervening, in the Middle East, is intervening in a family drama, also does so sometimes in ways that are shockingly cynical. And so you see that there's another layer of complexity, which 
we Americans have grappled with is you have an entire, when, when Americans go to war, when Americans get involved in another country, there's also an entire le- level of bureaucracy that kits, kicks in with its own modus operandi, which might sometimes be very contrary to the ideals that those who support the American vision have. An absolutely brilliant, I say brilliant drama. This is one of the best series on televisions that I have seen since Damages, which I I think is also one of the great series that has been produced on television in recent years. So I recommend you all see this. Uh, it's it's The final episode was aired. It may be rebroadcast now as FX debates. Check this out. This is what just blows my mind. We don't know if there's going to be season two. We don't know if there's going to be season two. I think it's a brilliant series. My husband thinks it's a brilliant series. Everyone that I talk to that starts to watch it agrees. And yet, there are, there's a debate now. There's a question mark. Is this going to be renewed for season two? Has it earned season two? I say categorically it has. But one of the problems is this series has been attacked by some left-wing publications who are arguing that the portrayal of the Arabs is a little bit too simplistic and stereotypical. And of course, that's a bunch of nonsense. It's written by folks who know the Arab world very well. And as the actor himself says, he's, he's, he's an Israeli actor, but he knows the Arab world also extremely well. He is trying to show you how complex the character of Jamal is. And I don't think you can see this series and not conclude that, All of the complexities are present, both in his character, in that of his wife, that of the mother, that of the whole family, and also the complexities of power that the family is forced to to deal with. So I am appalled that this series is being attacked by the left wing. I do not think it is in any way stereotypical. In fact, I'm going to take my pen to paper to try to illustrate how important this series is, how important a tool of education it is for the American public. And I think that if this series continues, it's going to be a real landmark in American movie making because we need more movies about the Middle East because we need to better understand these countries that we are intervening in. When you think about it, we've been embroiled in war now for over a decade, and there are very few movies about it that are made not just from the perspective of American soldiers going to combat. There's many excellent movies that are made from that perspective. But what about the perspective of the people in the Middle East and written by those who understand both the Middle East and who are sympathetic towards the American idealistic vision of bringing democracy there. I think we need a lot more dramas like this. I think it expands the public's uh, sphere of knowledge. And I think it's going to be the wave of the future because we have to deal with many, many, many Arabs coming into the American nation coming into Canada, coming into the West, their culture is gaining greater and greater influence. I think shows like this are, this is basically a pioneer. There's going to be many others like it. And I think that's all to the good, because if we're going to intervene in such areas and if we're going to have such massive immigrants from the Arab world, well, we better start understanding them. I am all for season two and three and four and five of Tyrant. Brilliant acting, brilliant uh, story writing, brilliant uh, directing, brilliant everything. And how insane that it isn't an automatic that there is season two. Well, not if we have anything to say and do about it. You're listening to Dr. Dr. Grace the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, upholding values that never die. Well, if you ask me where I come from, here's what I tell everyone. I was born by God's dear grace in an extraordinary place with the stars and stripes and the eagle flies It's a big old land with countless dreams and happiness ain't out of reach Hard work pays off the way it should Yeah, I've seen enough 
enough to know that we've got it good Where the stars and stripes And the eagle fly There's a lady This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace